Okay, let's go to our Bibles and go to First Peter. Uh, again, we were uh, in First Peter last week, but I want to just read the, the passage we looked at and then continue on in, in uh, the subject of uh, the trial of our faith. First Peter chapter 1. And look at verse, uh, start at verse number 3. I'm going to go to verse number, number 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. So we talked about Peter. Now Peter is saying this. He says the trying of your faith. So we know that Peter went through trials. We talked a little bit last week, mentioned, I think I just started it, started talking about it, when Peter, we would consider what he did as a trial of his faith when he um, denied the Lord. But I don't know if I talked about it very much, but it, I don't believe that it was so much a, a failure of his faith, but a failure in his life because of his own self-confidence. Remember what he said. Well, let's go over there. Go to Mark uh, chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. And he says to Jesus in uh, verse number 29, Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. I'm not going to be offended. And, of course, right that night, and Jesus tells him right after that, you're going to deny me three times. Of course, Peter in his self-confidence. Now, I'm not getting down on Peter. I think people do too much of that in general. Um, he did speak up, but he, he had a great faith. When, when people, Jesus said, are you going to go away from me? You're going to leave too? Well, to his disciples, and Peter stands up and he says, no. You have the words of eternal life. When Jesus asked, uh, whom do men say that I am? Peter said, or they said, who men do, but he said, who do you say I am? Peter stood up and said, uh, I don't know if he stood up. He stood out. And he said, uh, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we shouldn't make, uh, think of Peter being less spiritual than the other disciples. Peter knew who Christ was. But when he stood there at the fire and they said, you were with that, you were with Jesus, and he denied him, he was standing on his own. He wasn't depending on Christ. He wasn't depending on his faith in God. I believe he still had faith in Christ, faith in God. So I don't believe it was a, um, a, a, a loss of faith, but a loss of <laughs> a loss of his integrity because he stood on his own instead of standing uh, with the Lord and listening to him, following the Lord. Peter's failure was in himself and not in the Lord. I want you to see um, uh, one of the kings in uh, of Judah back in Second Chronicles chapter 14. Remember, all of the kings of the northern kingdom were evil. And some of the kings in the southern kingdom of Judah were good. And this one is uh, a good one. His name was Asa. Second Chronicles chapter 14. And 
And I want you to look to start at verse number 9. Okay? Now keep in mind, uh, Judah, these people were constantly fighting. People were fighting, fighting against Israel, Israel were fighting others. And they just, everybody wanted to be like Russia, okay? They wanted to control everybody else. Um, so this is what it, what it tells us. Verse number 9. And there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with an host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots and came to Marisha. How many is a thousand thousand? Hmm? I'm not hearing you. You know, you know how much it is. I just didn't hear you. Go ahead, Owen. A million. Okay, that's just the that's just the the the, um, the host. He says. And then he says another 300 chariots. So there's probably another 300 men, maybe uh, uh, two in a in a chariot. But so you have a million people coming out. Then Asa went out against him. Now he went out against him. Why? Because he was come, this guy, this leader was coming to attack him. Okay, but Asa goes out, and he realized he's going to have to fight. They set the battle in array in the valley of Zephathah at Marisha. But now look what he does. And Asa cried out unto the Lord his God and said, Now, okay, I'm going to stop for a second. This is, what, this is his prayer to the Lord, but listen to what he says and what he knows about God. He says, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Now, what's he saying? He's not, he's not that the Lord cares nothing about him. He said, Lord, it, any way the battle goes, any, any, no matter how many people are there, it's like what David said about uh, his battle with Goliath. The battle is the Lord's. Okay? It's not about how many people, how strong they are, how many chariots, how many horses. It's about... Who's doing the fighting? And so he says, um, Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go, uh, go against this multitude. O, o Lord, listen to what he says, O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against who? Thee. He doesn't say, don't let man prevail against us. He says, we're going out under your authority. We're going out in your name. And as we go out, Lord, we should win because they're fighting against you. And, and, and like I said last week, uh, and I've said it before about Saul, when Jesus came, he says, why do you persecute me? God takes it personally. Verse 12, so the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And so God, they went through this trial here. Asa was, <laughs> I'll say, on trial. As the Ethiopians, this great multitude, and if you read it, read about it, there was probably twice as many Ethiopians as there were uh, Judeans, uh, the Israelites fighting against them. And so Asa said, basically it's out of my hands. I'm going to go out and do my fighting. But God you're doing it. It's your battle. And so that's the way Peter should have looked at it. That's the way we should look at trials. It's not my battle. God's putting me through this, yes. I'm having to deal with this situation, but God is the one doing the work. And so that's, that's what needs to be uh, strong in our minds. And if we fail... Uh, in something because we are depending on ourself, uh, that should just be a stepping stone to further growth, further strength in the Lord. Yes, I fail. I should learn from that. I should go on from that. Go over to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now remember, Paul, this isn't dealing with this passage here isn't, isn't dealing with it, <clears throat> but remember, he had a trial, a consistent, maybe a constant trial in his life. It was that thorn in the flesh that he talked about. 
but I'm, we're going to read about it a little bit later. But look at this, what he says in verse number 8. He says, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, <coughs> which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Now, keep in mind, he knows, uh, we know Paul recognized his position and all the troubles that he was going through, because going to go through, because God said, uh, you're going to suffer for me. He recognized it. He understood that. So when he says he despaired of life, there's another passage of Scripture. He says, we went through these things, but we were not in despair. What he's saying is that there was a, the possibility in this situation that we might die. Okay, we just, okay, this might be it. <coughs> so he says we were pressed out of measure. Then in verse 9 he says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. He says we shouldn't be trusting ourselves. And who does he say to trust? We should be trusting in God. And he gives the he gives the uh, evidence of he can raise the dead. And if he can do that, he can keep you from dying. He can allow you to die and then raise the dead. Whatever God's will is, we submit to because he's the one. Not don't trust myself. Every situation, every trial <coughs> to depend on the Lord. Now I'll go over to chapter 12. He talks about this thorn in the flesh. But again, he's, he's saying, he, he talks about uh, that he relies on God. Verse number 9, And he said unto me, Jesus said, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, this is all that we, we have of Paul's what Jesus said to Paul. <coughs> but he says, uh, my strength, or God, Christ's strength, is made perfect in your weakness. means it is, it is the strength, it is the maturity, it is the uh, active force that is working, not your own strength. Because your strength is weak. So, so Paul says this, most gladly, therefore, because of this, because it's... Uh, my weakness shows the strength of God as I go through the trials. He says, I will gladly glory in my infirmities, my troubles, my, my difficulties, that the power of Christ may rest on me. I'm glad that I'm weak. I'm glad that I cannot... You know, that, that's... that's um, the weakness that we have... And I, I, I don't want to say just weakness. It's like Paul has this thorn in the flesh, whatever it is. He can't get rid of it. And God says, no, you're going to hang on to that. It's going to be punishing you, persecuting consistently from now on all your life. I'm not going to take it away. Because I want you to recognize that your power, the power that you have is my power, not your own. People can think too highly of themselves and trust in themselves. And so when we recognize, listen, I am nothing. God is everything. God is the one that gets the glory. The trial of our faith is not just to see if we have strong faith, but a trial of our faith is to strengthen us, make our faith stronger. How many of you have ever, I've never done this, uh, you've probably, maybe you've heard of it. Some of us probably have heard of a taffy pull. Anybody have heard that? Never done it, but have you heard of it? you never heard of a taffy pull? Okay, that, that's that thing you see at the, in the, uh, on the, the wharf over in Monterey, the taffy's going around. Anybody ever see the candy making? All right, there's, there's this big machine and it's got this stuff on it and it's going like this and it's pulling the taffy. Well, a taffy pull is where um, people get together and they make this candy and then they start pulling it against each other. Why? Well, it makes it better. 
It doesn't make it tougher, it makes it softer. But that's the way that the taffy is supposed to, not that I want to teach you how to do that, but, uh, but putting our faith to a test is, is that exercise of that, like taffy, in a sense, okay? God works on us to give us more, stronger faith, and then give Him the glory. Go over to the book of Job. We just sang that song, and I love that song that uh, Ron Hamilton uh, wrote, Rejoice in the Lord. So clear, and it comes from uh, the book of Job. Job chapter 23. And you remember what happened to Job? Okay, he lost everything. Except what? Two things he didn't lose. His wife and his life. They, they rhyme with each other. You can always remember that. He didn't lose his life, didn't lose his wife, okay? But he lost everything else, including his ten kids. Okay? Now look at verse number 10. Now he, he talks, talks about not being able to see God. Then he goes on to verse 10. He says, But he, God, knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You know, there's the there's the picture. Is what he's what he's using is that picture of <clears throat> refining gold. And when you when you apparently I I've never melted gold and tried this, but they say this is what happens. You melt the gold down uh, because it's uh, it's mixed in with dirt and everything. And when you melt melt that down, all of the junk that's not gold rises to the top and you skim that off, and then what you have left is the pure gold. So, so what, did you have, what did you have to do to the gold in order to do that? You had to melt it. You had to make it hot. You had to burn it, practically. And so Job is saying, listen, it's like God putting a fire under me and putting me through this refining process and when he's done with me, I am going to be more pure than I was before. Not, not, not in my salvation. I'm not going to have more of God's righteousness. But I'm going to be better at what I do. I'm going to be better at my faith in the Lord. I'm going to be able to trust him more because he's seen me through this. I recognize what God was doing in my life, he says. You know, if, uh, if Job... This this verse proves that he did right. Okay, he it proves that he came forth of this um, better than he was before. But if he, we'd have to look at his life. We'd have to look at what God did in his life to see that he came forth as gold. If he never even said that, but he knew if he did not recognize what God was doing. How would that have been if how would his suffering have benefited him? That's a funny word, benefited. It wouldn't have. He could have, he lost his kids and what all of his things and all of his kids were just gone. How would he have been better off? He would not have been. If he didn't recognize God working in his life. It would have just been poor me. It would have just been about him, trusting in himself. But he recognized God at work, and he came forth stronger. And of course, we know he got ten more kids, and he got twice as much as everything else that he ever had. Not that God's going to do that to everybody who goes through a trial, but uh, we know that God used Job to teach us that we should be uh, recognizing him in every situation. He would have been worse off, really, if he never, uh, if he didn't acknowledge God doing it, making him better. Man has been deceived by Satan. Man, in general, not us. Okay, we are men, but we're not deceived in the same way that many people are. Men have been deceived by Satan into thinking that they can live without God. Those Christians, 
They're just wimps. They just need something to lean on. It's not about that. It's not about just leaning. We do lean on Christ, but it's about salvation. It's about righteousness. It's more than just a crutch, Christianity. And they don't realize that Jesus Christ came to destroy that way of thinking because that's a work of Satan. Go over to 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, look at verse number 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Not just sin, but all of the influence of Satan on mankind. Jesus came to destroy that. And we reckon we need to recognize that and see that God is to be depended on because God wants to work out all the Satan's influences on us. Sometimes the trials of our faith, I'll say, are brought on by ourselves. Remember when David went to went and fought Goliath? Do you think that was a trial? Well, we, we, sometimes we think it's so e- it was so easy for David. <laughs> I never stood before a nine-foot-tall man uh, with a sling or a gun. But uh, David went before him, and what did he say? The battle is the Lord's, right? But it was a trial, but it was a trial of his choice. It wasn't necessarily something that God was putting him through. Okay, and but he went into it. We can make ourselves go into trials, but God can still use those. Did David come out stronger? Yeah, I would say so. He went in strong though, and you wonder how much stronger could he have gotten if he was ready to. Well, he was depending on the Lord. There were times in David's life where he didn't depend on the Lord. Go over to uh, 2 Chronicles again. To go to chapter 20. We'll close right here after this. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. This prophet Jehaziel speaks, and I believe it's to uh, Jehoshaphat, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, look at verse number 14. Then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Madaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Okay? There's a great multitude. We're not going to go into how many. not going to pay a lot of attention to that. I mean, there's a lot of people coming against them, just like we saw in, in Asa's life. But he goes on and he says, Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. And ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. He says you won't even need to fight. That, that happens in this time. But you've got to keep in mind, That was a big trial for them. You know, we don't have to fight these battles like this, physical battles. But every day we go into some sort of battle. Maybe it's small, maybe it's big in our life. But we need to recognize, you know, I am on God's side. And as I go into my day by faith, God fights the battles. 
I need to rest in him and letting him work through me, in me, so I can get stronger in my walk with him. And I can, as we do that, as we go through these trials, little by little, we get stronger. <laughs> and I don't believe God just keeps bringing us bigger and bigger troubles. I don't think that's what he wants to do. He wants us to stand up. He wants others, I believe, to others to see us. And other people without Christ to see us depending on the Lord. And then they also could come. God doesn't have to have super gigantic Christians by the time you die. I have all faith and I'm just so strong now because I'm trusting in the Lord. Now I'm getting ready to die. Now what? Why should, why should I be so strong in the Lord at the, at the end of my life? No, it's all the way up there to that point. Yes, I might be strong when I die, but how many people have seen my life as I depended on the Lord? You know, he wants them to come to faith also. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love for us. Thank you for giving us trials. Lord, it, it, we, we don't ask for them, uh, but we do want to grow in our faith. We want you to be first in our lives. So Lord, when we do get a trial, help us to handle it properly. Help us not ever to de depend on our own selves. Lord, we are weak. You're strong. So we need to rest in you and rest on your strength in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.